All right, our last and final session will be Seeing is Believing, Media Integrity in a Post-Truth World, presented by Nasir Memon. Nasir is a professor in the Department of Commuter Computer Science and Engineering at New York University, Tandon School of Engineering. He is also an affiliate faculty at the Computer Science Department in the Curant Institute of Mathematical Sciences at NYU. He introduced cybersecurity studies at NYU and is a co-founder of the Center for Cybersecurity at NYU New York and the Center for Cybersecurity at NYU Abu Dhabi. He is also the founder of the Os excuse me, Osiris Lab, CSAW, the Bridge to Tannen program, as well as the Cyber Fellows program at NYU. He has received several best paper awards and awards for excellence in teaching. He has also been on the editorial boards of several journals and was the editor in chief of the IEEE Transactions on Information Security and Forensics. He is an IEEE fellow and an SPIE fellow for his contributions to image compression and media security and forensics. His research interests include digital forensics, biometrics, data compression, net network security, and security and human behavior. Please help me welcome Nasir Memon. <clears throat> This is work, yeah. Good afternoon, I, <clears throat> I apologize for that long introduction. I, I did not send that abstract, <laughs> that, that bio, but uh, uh, at the end of the day, that's the last thing you want to hear. Uh, but what I'll uh, talk about today in these 20 minutes, uh, and leave time for questions hopefully, uh, is perhaps a little bit different than what you've been sort of hearing in the rest of the conference, right? Uh, uh, and I'll look at what has been happening uh, with respect to media in the last few years uh, and point to a disturbing sort of development that is taking place and uh, look at what possible solutions there might be, right? So uh, I'm at NYU Center for Cybersecurity. If you're looking to hire cybersecurity students, uh, if you want to do a master's in cybersecurity for $15,000 only, uh, come and talk to me. Uh, so that was my advertisement, right? So, so we live in a, today we live in a world of uh, rich with multimedia. We, we carry uh, a high resolution camera in our pocket 24-7. Uh, I may forget my wife and kid at home, but I won't forget my phone, right? It's always with me. And we take pictures and we share them, we email them, we tweet them, we Snapchat them, whatever. We kind of do a lot of things with them. Uh, and, and, and we are able to do so because once we digitize media, images, video, et cetera, once we can convert them, represent them as bits, it's easy to send them around, compress them, transmit them, et cetera, right? So it makes all these things very much easier than the analog world. But that same convenience that you get when you are dealing with digital media, media with respect to communication cost, et cetera, uh, also has another issue with it that it can be easily be manipulated, right? Bits are bits. You can change a one to a zero, and now you have something different. So ever since digital media like for, uh, has been around, there have always been hobbyists who look at this media and whatever, take this media and create something fake, right? Take a digital media. And there's a lot of software available for, for doing this, right? Uh, and so digitally, media can be e easily be manipulated, right? And that's been going on for a long time, just mostly for like fun and games, right? Uh, the, on, the other, on the other hand, I'll just move forward to save time. Uh, computer graphics also is getting very sophisticated. Right? Today we can render very realistic looking images, right? Uh, when you see your kids playing those games, I mean, the, the environments are looking more and more realistic that we can render images which look, look very real. So uh, we have two images of uh, young women out there. Uh, how many of you think that the one on the left, this side, is real? How many of you think the one on the right is real? 
Well, they're both fake, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so we can really create uh, images that, that look real using computer graphics techniques, well, whereas they're not, right? So these two things are happening, and, and we've been doing this too. Uh, there's a video in there, but it's okay. Uh, so, and we can do the same thing with video. Can you play the video? Uh, yeah. And there's audio in there too. But Congratulations. <laughs> How do you feel? I got to pay. <laughs> I believe he said he had to go pee. Yeah. So, next, next. So, so this, this was created, what, more than a decade ago. Uh, many of you have seen it. But it took hundreds of thousands of dollars to create the scene, right? In, in a, a very sophisticated studio uh, using state of the art equipment, etc. cetera. Right. Congratulations. Uh, so, that that has been happening, but on the other hand, uh, in social media, uh, so, so that's been happening for many years, but social media also started seeing instances of these, right? Uh, and it started getting nasty, right? As in the beginning, social media was great, internet, you could reconnect with your high school friends and talk to your grandma, grandpa, etc. It was all fine until it started getting nasty, and today social media is a very nasty place to be in, I, I believe. Uh, and, and you start seeing things like that, right? So now this is not just fake images, but fake images created with the purpose of polarization, right? A purpose of demeaning someone. Uh, and and that's, that starts becoming sort of a problem because some people might look at this and believe it to be true, right? Uh, many of us won't, but some may, may believe that to be true and, and that's, that's a problem, right? And that is led us to this point today where suddenly, I mean, technology has evolved much more than what I've shown so far. Uh, suddenly, just the notion of seeing is believing is under attack, right? If you, uh, if you cannot believe what you see, we have a problem. Right? Uh, now, being able to detect fake images and fake video, uh, this, this, the problem of doing that, uh, techniques for doing that, have been around for a long time under the sort of umbrella of digital forensics, right? And it was do more done in the law enforcement kind of scenarios where there was some evidence and the evidence was formed in a video or image and, you, and somebody had to testify in a court saying, yes, this is a real image or real video, right? That sort of activity has been going on for some time. And the techniques that, that do that essentially look at the camera internals of a camera, a basic camera pipeline. So you have the lens, light from the scene goes through the lens and falls on a sensor, right? A sensor then converts photons into electrons, say, and the intensity of light uh, is then represented by, say, the, the measurement of the, of the voltage or whatever that you do, measurement of the current, right, at, at that point. In the, and, and so thereby you can now create a digital representation of a scene. Right? But if you just measure intensity, you're getting a black and white image, a grayscale image. Right? So what modern cameras do, typically, uh, is you have this filter in front, which filters out either red light, a green light, a blue light, one of them, not all three. Right? So what you then get is you're getting at each point of the scene, you know the intensity of red, intensity of green, intensity of blue. You're sampling them. Right? And then the, the, the ones that are missing, you simply interpolate them. And then at every point, you then have red, red intensity of red, intensity of green, and intensity of blue, and you have a full color image, right? And after that, lots of things happen, right? Depending on the camera vendor, all kinds of processing happens uh, to finally render a visually pleasing image, right? The different vendors have different techniques they use in order to what they think is good quality sort of output, right? So this has been happening for, what, 20 years? Uh, and, and so when you, when you uh, manipulate an image, when you, when you modify an image by doing any particular cut and paste operation or removing something, uh, there are telltale signs that are left in the photograph. If you understand the pipeline, then based on that pipeline, you can like, look for these telltale signs which indicate that there may be manipulation out here. And you can broadly classify these telltale signs into three categories, right? One is what you call digital integrity. The, so there is a, so for example, one example, uh, one example of digital integrity, uh, that is the values of the pixels themselves. 
right, is this notion of uh, chromatic aberration. Because the lens is curved, when light goes through uh, the lens, red, green, and blue, they, they bend at slightly different angles. So at these edges, there is this blurring, this of red, green, and blue. There is that weird distribution depending on that, on the on the lens, nature of that lens, right? And one can measure that. And two different camera models may have two different lenses, and the chromatic aberration may be different, right? At a very high level, uh, gets um, uh, mathematical actually measuring it and modeling it, etc. But but that can be done, and that maybe the presence or absence of it or the variation of that, you can say that something was uh, uh, modified. Uh, another approach which has been quite successful is this notion of uh, photoresponse non-uniformity noise. So when photons fall on a sensor, a particular sensor, a particular point, the number of electrons emitted are not exactly the same as, even if the same number of photons falls on the next, the neighboring sensor, the number of electrons emitted will be slightly different because they're physically each little piece is slightly, slightly different. And that's called photoresponse non-uniformity. And essentially what that, as a result of that, every camera leaves a very unique fingerprint in, in every image that is taken by that camera. And I don't mean a model, I mean this specific camera. Right? Every image taken by this specific camera has a very, very unique noise pattern that can be extracted. And based on that, you can match and say, yep, this image was indeed taken by this camera. How do you do that? Just like you do with that gun ballistics, for where you've read in detective novels where you have a gun and you suspect this, you have a bullet, fired bullet, and you dis the bullet casing or whatever they're called, and then you have uh, a gun and you want to know if this bullet was indeed fired from this gun. You 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 take that gun, fire a few more bullets on it, see the scratch marks on that on the on the surface, and match the two. And based on that, you can say, yep, this bullet was indeed fired from this gun, you can do that now with images, right? And again, this is a decade old. You can tell that this image was actually taken from this camera. So if you thought you simply deleted the header and you, nobody will know it was, the, it was your image was taken from your camera, no, that won't work. You have to do, do more than that. Uh, but nevertheless, that allows us to detect tampering as well, because if one takes two uh, uh, an image, take another part from another camera, put it in here, overlap, or do things of that sort. One, if one knows potentially what the camera is, one can then detect manipulations. Right? Uh, so these, this is another digital. A second type of techniques. So and and there are many more such digital integrity techniques. Right? Doesn't uh, more than a dozen of them. A second type of digital integrity uh, type of integrity techniques are what is called physical integrity. So essentially, if you do a manipulation and that like violates certain physical laws, right? Uh, if one can detect that they're doing so, then you know that perhaps there's a problem here. So what physical laws? Just shadows, right? I mean, if you have two people, then and if you can compute the light source, direction of the light, and if shadows are not properly aligned, you know that this is kind of violating physical laws, and this must have been a tampered image because the shadows are not consistent. Right? So based on things like that, one can say. Uh, and uh, another notion of physical integrity is the notion of electric network frequency. So for example, this video, if, I don't know if a video is being captured of me, but if there was, uh, that, that video, uh, or let me back off a bit. So the electric network, right? The, is, since it's AC current, it's delivered at certain frequency, 60 hertz a second, uh, 50 hertz a second, depending on whether US or Europe. So if this is alternating at 60 hertz a second, the light is flickering at 120, because every peak causes a peak in the uh, illumination, and every sort of pit reduces the illumination. So the illumination is actually flickering at the rate of 120. You and me cannot see it, but if you take a video of me, right, that flickering can be computed. Now, it so happens that this flickering is, is, not, is, is not consistent. It varies over time. Uh, the, the electric grid, the suppliers, try to maintain it, at, maintain it at 60, but based on consumption and production, it varies, 59.7, 60.1, 59.3, et cetera. It's varying, and it's varying randomly. Right? And if one is measuring that, that variation, and if one is given a video, one can compute the variation, then one can actually say that, yep, this was taken in Manhattan at 5.20 PM on so-and-so day. Right? You can nail it down in time. Right. You may not be able to nail it down in space, whether it was taken on Upper West Side, or East Side, or Midtown, or Downtown. You, can't you can just say it was taken in that grid. 
right? Whatever the geographical region of that, that grid. And that could be large in some instances, right? But you can do that. And the third is semantic integrity. So you can, based on logos and things of that sort, you can tell that, no, this is a fake image, right? So that's been going on for a long time, and we've developed techniques to do that. They kind of work. I myself have been working for almost 15 to 20 years on these problems, and yeah, they kind of work, but a clever adversary can really mess around and, and defeat these techniques as well. For every forensics technique, there is a counter-forensics technique, right? So, but today, things have changed. Now we have techniques based on machine learning. AI is a nice marketing term, but techniques based on machine learning. One can actually create uh, images that look real, right, but are not at all so. So for example, now you can make someone smile, or make them angry, or make them cry, make them older, make them younger, may change uh, night into day, and day into night, and, and all can be done in a very automated manner. People have trained uh, machine learning models to do that. You input an image of your, yourself, it'll make you smile, right? As simple as that. And it'll look pretty realistic, right? I'm exaggerating a bit, but we're getting there, right? So, and not only that, but Maybe if you could click that video and play it. We can even create- We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. And stay woke, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> next, next slide. So, so, and that's a complete fake video, right? Obviously, Obama would not say something like that. So, so we've now... And, and it looked very real. It looked extremely real. We now have developed this capability of doing this, right? As, as long as we have enough video of Obama, right? And most celebrities have, and all of us also have been uploading videos of ourselves everywhere and pictures. And once I, you can model me well, you can now use that to make me say anything or do anything. You can create videos of me saying or doing anything, right? Which is kind of dangerous, uh, especially if it can be done easily at low cost. Is that possible today? Not really. Uh, most graduate students struggle to come up with a good quality deep fake, but we are slowly getting there. We are, being able, we, are able, we are getting better and better at it. We are getting developing techniques that allow us to do that, right? And that's a problem. I mean, let's, we won't play, play these videos, but here I have examples here of scenes that move the world, right? Nixon was nailed by his audio tapes. He could have said, oh, that, that was fake, right? Um, Romney, right, maybe lost the election when he made that 1% comment, which was recorded, right? Again, we could have said that was fake. Uh, World War II, the horrific scenes of what was happening in the concentration camps, that moved the world. That, that sort of um, got finally US into action and, and sort of joined the war. Right? Us landing on the moon. There's still people apparently who don't believe it, but we all like the, the, the video of, of us landing on the moon was an amazingly moving scene. Right? The video of that young guy in Tiananmen Square, like standing in front of the tank and not letting the tank move. I mean, these are scenes that move the world. The problem of us being able to create fake videos which look very realistic is that real ones like this now can be claimed as fake. Right? The truth is, is sort of the victim here. Truth, truth can be the casualty, where suddenly real things are no longer believed as, as, as true because we have the capability to create fake media. 
right? And that's the problem I sort of wanted to point out. Uh, yeah. So what, what do we do, right? How do we deal with this problem? Uh, there's a good amount of work going on in the academic world uh, for detecting fake videos and fake images, and they're all reasonable. Uh, but many of them are simply going down the cat and mouse game, right? You're going down this uh, escalation in arms kind of. You, you, you develop a technique to uh, detect. Uh, somebody will develop a technique to defeat it. Uh, professors themselves will do it just for fun, right? Just to show that the detection technique doesn't go, just for advancement of science, right? And we'll keep doing that, and, and there's no sort of, that may not be the best way to go. Uh, we need to keep doing that, but they, that may not give us definitive answers because there's always this cat and mouse game involved. Another thing we could do is perhaps create these what I call islands of trust, creates mechanisms, create pools of media that we somehow find them to be trusted, right? Uh, how do we do it? Well, uh, maybe one, one of the things we could do is inform public to be able to not simply believe everything that they see and have things like warning labels, right? Uh, so that, that, that sort of inhibits them uh, from, from sharing fake, fake media. And I've done some work showing that these warning labels really do work up to a point, um, uh, right? And, uh, but uh, depending on the interesting results out there, I can share with you in more detail later. Uh, the second thing you can do is use a very commonly used integrity mechanism now, a blockchain, right? So we've developed an app which you can, in your, in your phone, and you using the app, you take a picture. It will hash it. Hashing it is not as simple because it's not a cryptographic hash, right? Uh, and get the time and space of place. And again, that's not simple because it depends on what you're trusting, right? Depending on your trust model. Uh, get those attributes and, and insert it into a blockchain. So that can now tell you that this image, yes, was indeed taken at this place and, that, uh, and at this particular time. Right. Uh, a third uh, approach that we are exploring, which I find, out, find to be quite interesting, is creating images themselves, which are forensically friendly. Right? So earlier on, I showed you a camera pipeline that from the lens all the way to the final output, there are lots of stuff that happens. That entire camera pipeline is being replaced in the next few years will be replaced by a machine learning pipeline, right? So it'll be replaced by a deep network. Light, deep network, final image. So one can, what we've shown is one can actually create, train these deep networks to create images which are fragile to manipulation. So when you manipulate it, the signs pop up easily, right? So in some sense, we are embedding a watermark, if you will, in the image, and that, that, that can work as well using these AI-like techniques. So let me stop there. And I don't know if you have time for questions. So. Are there um, this is amazing. This is something that I've been trying to understand more about. Um, and I was really interested in the, the e-witness um, running on the quorum chain. Um, is that something that, that like you have been developing with mm -hmm. the team? Are you planning to try to like get that available so it can like run and be embedded into like Twitter and things like that? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So we built an that. app and we're trying to get people to use it. So if there are, especially NGOs, law enforcement, we want to give it out to people so if they see something happening, they can actually take an image which they think of interest. And actually, the project started off with there was a National Institute of Justice, NIJ, that put a call for proposals to be able to provide in, uh, evidence from a cell phone without surrendering the phone, right? Because typically, uh, I mean, uh, the cell phones actually have been used to capture all kinds of interesting evidence. Uh, without cell phones, Black Lives Matters would not have happened because video and images were really captured, for example. But in this, we live in a country where that can be done with, without fear 
and with enough trust, but there are people living in other systems where they may be, f f they be scared to share these things or even give, the, give their phone. So this, it was developed with that intent, that somebody could take it and then be anonymous and put it up in a blockchain and then reveal later what, what is actually in the blockchain. So there's a authenticity associated with it. But so we want to make it available to the public as much as possible. Yeah. I, I haven't really researched the quorum chain. Is that was that developed just for this, or no, was, did you choose that we're one? We're just using take, one. Yeah, just that's the one you yeah, chose. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Very much. This is a really fascinating sure. presentation. Um, what do you think the role of the government and policymakers is in engaging with these issues? And do you think the bigger threat, or are they equal, is that it would discredit real materials, or that on many parts of the internet? There are people who are primed to believe that fake materials are real. Like, imagine if instead of giving a formal address in the Oval Office, Obama was showed kind of saying awful things that maybe certain political elements would believe he was saying, and they say, oh, see, this is what he really believes. Right. So both, both will happen, right? Uh, both sides are, are, one needs to attack the problem from both sides, protecting what is true, and at the same time trying to shine a light on what's clearly false, right? Uh, what I pointed out, and these are probably not the only approaches. We, we'll, uh, young people like you, will probably come up with other new approaches, and and but that's one thing we need to do. For the discrediting part, to be able to, so I think we just need to spread awareness. What the government can help is in like spreading awareness, saying that look, you really cannot uh, believe everything you see. I don't think you can regulate truth. Right, it's a problem. Uh, I think Australia is thinking of passing a law saying that it's illegal to post fake news. Now, like, what is fake news, right? <laughs> so, who who will be the judge of that? Uh, so, it's kind of a uh, slippery slope, and so I'm wary of that. But I do understand that this problem is not a problem that can be solved purely by technology. No, it needs law, it needs policy, it needs right economic incentives, uh, etc. What exactly they are, I don't know. But it's a problem we need to look at very seriously. Sorry if I didn't, if I copped out of an answer. But it's a very uh, deep question, right? It's an interesting question. All right. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Nasir.